Hello, my name is Martin Harold. I'm from Wagen University. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about measuring, reporting, and verification, or MRV, of forest-related activities uh, and their greenhouse gas impacts. And they are broadly uh, related to what's called RED+, plus, reducing emission from deforestation and forest degradation and also enhancement of carbon stocks, also called RED+. Plus. The framework for estimation and reporting of forest-related greenhouse gas emissions and removals are the IPCC Good Practice Guidelines, and they essentially require two types of data. One is called activity data. Activity data relate to the extent of land transitions, for example, the area of deforestation or the area of forest uh, related to forest degradation or enhancement of carbon stocks. The second important data input is what's called emission or removal factors, and these are greenhouse gas units per activity. So, for example, how much carbon is lost for a hectare of forest in case that one gets deforested. And the product of the two, so the area that has been affected by deforestation, times the loss of carbon per unit area, this is provided as the net emissions. Activity data in both emission factors and their estimations can benefit from Earth observation data. For estimating activity data, you could use Earth observation to map the areas of forest, non-forest, or the changes of deforestation or reforestation. To do that, you have to define what a forest is. There is no general definition, because every country can use their own forest definition. The FAO is using a generic one that is used for their global accounting. But the definition needs to be defined. And then you would derive, using Earth observation data as input, the areas and the transitions between, for example, forest and non-forest. What's very important is that activity data are in area units, so they are in hectares, and they need to be statistically robust estimates. That is why if you have maps of multiple points in time, you don't just count the pixels of forest and non-forest to get to an area estimation, but you use that as an input to a stratified area estimation procedure that gives you statistically robust area estimates and confidence interval. And guidance on that is provided, for example, by the methods and guidance document of GFOI. Earth observation data for estimating activity data are most commonly Sentinel and Landsat time series data, so in the order of 10 to 30 meter spatial resolution that are available at historical periods because you need a historical or you need a good historical coverage to provide estimates of changes. When you then use these mapping uh, results for estimating area changes using a stratified area estimation, you can also use very high resolution data or visual interpretation of very high resolution data to validate these results, but also to estimate the area. And these can be data from, for example, a planet or other high resolution data sources. This procedure is quite commonly done and almost all Red Plus countries, so all of almost all the tropical countries participating in Red Plus are using a combination of Landsat and Sentinel and high-resolution data to estimate the activity data for forest changes. When we talk about emission factors, we are reminded this is the change in carbon stocks per area unit. We are talking about also different pools of carbon. This include the, what's called the life pools, so above-ground biomass, the trees and shrubs, the below-ground biomass, just wood biomass, but also dead wood, litter, and soil. From an Earth observation perspective, we can basically estimate biomass at the above ground level or the other pools, they are not often directly be able to be estimated using Earth observation approaches. An emission factor can essentially be understood as the difference between the stocks, the carbon stocks before an event, for example, a deforestation event, and the carbon stocks after that event. So if you're talking about a conversion from a forest to a cropland, uh, we have the biomass before from the forest the biomass, or relatively low biomass afterwards, which is just basically the crops or the average value of the crops. And the difference between the two, that is what's called the emission factor in this case for deforestation. In terms of data sources for estimating emission factors, we have quite a choice. In theory, a destructive estimation is the best way to estimate biomass in a sense that you would cut a tree, dry it, and weigh it. And that would be a direct 
measurement of biomass. But that is not very practicable uh, in practice. So we have all kinds of non-destructive estimations of biomass. And the most common source are plot data done as part of national forest inventories. At these plot locations, you measure the trees and you can estimate the biomass from these measurements. There's an additional source, and that's now we're getting into the Earth observation domain. Airborne LiDAR data is quite a common source of biomass estimation if they are available, particularly, for example, in European and the US. As countries are making extensive use of that, and LiDAR data give you a lot of information about, yeah, for example, tree height and structure. From space-based data, there are a number of biomass maps, so estimations of biomass on the pixel level that can be used. And they are basically using mostly JEDI data. JEDI is a space-based LiDAR and radar data. So both active remote sensing data sources are the most useful for providing input for the estimation of emission factors. Today, almost all countries are using still national forest inventory or some kind of plot data for estimating the emission factors. The use of biomass maps for emission factor estimation is a very evolving field, and that is driven by an increasing availability of space-based data useful to estimate biomass and carbon stocks. In the latest revision of the IPCC Good Practice Guidelines, there is a section on guidance on how to use biomass maps for national estimation, and that could be, for example, useful to develop emission factors in areas that are not sampled from national forest inventory data, for example, in inaccessible areas. There's also an option to really think about the integration with activity data, so with maps of deforestation or reforestation and combine them with biomass maps to get to more spatially explicit estimations of carbon, forest carbon sinks and sources. And there are also new approaches in the research domain that look at the direct estimation of biomass change from multi-date biomass maps. Also, biomass maps could be useful for countries as an independent source to verify uh, their results and have it as an independent uh, assessment whether the national estimations are within line or whether there are areas that need further attention. There are a number of global biomass maps being produced from space-based data on a regular basis. For example, the European Space Agency's CCI Biomass Initiative has been producing global biomass estimates at 100 meter resolution for the years 2010, 2017, 2018 and 2020 and will continue to do that. These global maps are increasing also in terms of their accuracy, but they will not be able to be easily used off the shelf uh, without some kind of national calibration, which would mean, for example, applying national definitions, for example, of forests, but also on biomass. But also they often have uncertainties uh, when it comes to integrating them into national estimation. So that's where integration of, for example, available national plot data sources and the biomass map is a practical way forward. At the moment, quite a few of these approaches are being tested in and with countries. There is not a lot of use of biomass maps at the moment for national greenhouse gas inventories, but that will change in the years to come with better approaches to integrate space-based data and also to fill country gaps that cannot be easily filled with classical national forest inventory approaches. And with that, I would also like to end and remind you that we have important Earth observation input when it comes to activity data estimation that is quite operationally done by many countries and we have an increasing availability of biomass maps that can support the estimation of emission factors in many countries and we expect a lot of development in that in the years to come.